Up next, the review of the family game, Talisman Legendary Tales from Pegasus Hill. All right, up first, in the efforts of being transparent, I did receive a review copy of Talisman Legendary Tales from Pegasus Spiel at Origins 2019, and I almost had to sell my soul just to give it to them, for them to give it to me. I literally begged for this one. Talisman Legendary Tales was designed by Michael Palm and Lucas Zock, and features art by Zat. I'm guessing this is someone like the Miko, who has a cute name. Cute. Uh, that sounded demeaning. I don't mean it that way. A, a moniker instead of the real name. Unless someone out there is actually named Zat. It was first published in 2018 by Pegasus Spiel here in North America. It's a cooperative game that plays one to six players in about 45 minutes to an hour, depending on who you're playing with and how much time they take. Best way for anyone to see what you get with a copy of Talisman Legendary Tales Check out our unboxing video on YouTube. We'll be sure to put a link to that in the show notes. Now I'm not going to go through every bit you get in the box. I do want to comp. Well, uh, I do want to comment on a couple of things. First off, the game has an excellent rule book. Very quick to read. Plenty of examples. Component quality is pretty much top notch. With some of the best drawstring bags I've ever touched in a board game. You get seven of them. If I hated this game, I would steal them and put them in other games that need drawstring bags. Finally, both myself and my girls really appreciate the fact that every character in the game comes with male and female presenting versions. And that's a great touch. Well, uh, tell us a bit about how you played Talisman Legendary Tales. All right, so this is a cooperative game with five scenario, a five-part scenario-based campaign. And what I mean by scenario-based campaign is that they are meant to be played in order, but you don't carry anything over from one scenario to the next. So there's no like leveling up or anything like that. Now, each scenario can be played at level one, two, or three. And somewhat interestingly, you don't unlock new scenarios until you hit a certain star threshold based on those levels. And why I found this odd, especially for the first scenario, is you can't unlock scenario two until you beat scenario one at level two. So I'm not even sure why they offer level one for the first one, because you play level one and then just have to play it again. Though, once you get through the first one, it kind of makes sense because to unlock Scenario 3, you need 4. And you could do that by beating Scenario 1 at Level 3 and Scenario 2 at Level 1, or both at Level 2. But overall, it's just kind of weird that you even have this level system. So no matter what, you're in for some repetition before you advance through, unless you're willing to jump in at the highest level. Yeah, not even the highest, just at, the, at Level 2. As long as you do Level 2 every time, you can unlock everything. Now, the goal of each scenario is to find a talisman. So your overall goal for the campaign is to find five talismans. In each individual scenario, you need to do it before time runs out. And each story has its own, uh, each scenario has its own story about where to find each talisman. And these are all actually rather well-told stories. Like they're very involved and they're all very different. To set up each scenario, you set up the map, which is a bunch of hex tiles. And then you seed it with encounter tokens based on like where it says in the rule book, like the forest gets two and the caves get one and the, the, the fairy circle gets three. Then each scenario then has a board made of thick card. Again, you're at that terraforming Mars style card, but for, it, it works for this game. You then take this card. One of the players is going to start reading it and it's going to give you any additional setup and tell you what your objective is and where your characters start. And it always starts with having to go out and encounter those various tokens you put out and then somehow through them unlock the next part of the scenario. And exactly what you're doing is different. You may be trying to find herbs. You may be trying to hunt down goblins. You might be trying to find a dragon and kill it. It's all different based on the scenarios. Now, each step in the scenario is going to add something new to the story, and you'll often need to seed the board again with more tokens. And this is unique because what they use is basically I Spy or Where's Waldo or whatever you call that nowadays, where it's going to tell you to put tokens on map tiles that have a specific symbol. And in some scenarios, which symbols are used are actually different based on what you did in the first part, which is kind of neat. And they can be randomized because of it. So depending on what you collected the first time might change where you're going to put stuff for the second part of a scenario. That sounds like a fun task for kids. But for those of us a bit older whose eyes are starting to go, maybe a little less ideal? Yeah, once I get into my summary, um, I basically state exactly that. Personally, I would have really liked a reference sheet that just told me where all the symbols were so I can sit back and let my kids find them. And then when they get frustrated, they can't find them. 
just go, oh, no, just have you checked the tower yet? You know, that would have been a nice touch. Now, on your actual turn, playing the game, you're going to roll a die and move. So you got roll and move. Uh, the die is unique. It has a one, two twos, a three, and a four. The four has an hourglass symbol on it because it takes time if you move too far. And then a special portal symbol that lets you teleport. You're going to move around the board. You can ignore face down tokens. But if you see a face up one, it stops you. So it's just kind of like if there's a monster there, you have to stop and face it. Once you're done moving, you're going to flip up any of those tokens and then encounter them. Now, the encounters usually involve monsters or other hazards that you have to overcome, though sometimes it's like treasure chests you're trying to open. And the way you beat all these is you draw chips out of the player's bag. Now, every character has a unique bag with seven chips in it, and you're going to build these during the game. So you're going to pull them out, you're going to pull three of them, and look at the symbols on the chips. If the symbols on the chips match the symbols on the encounter token, you can defeat it, and then you get to draw a new chip from a treasure bag, which is a standalone bag, and then that chip can be given to any player, which is a nice co-op aspect. Now, some of the chips do other things, like there's one that will advance the time token, which is a bad thing, because if you run out of time, you lose. There's another one that's like draw a chip and draw an extra chip, and then the neatest one is there's one that'll let you draw a chip from another player's bag. And then, of course, the treasure chips have all kinds of other special abilities. Now, as an added level of tactics to the game, whenever you are supposed to draw from your bag, you have the option to put your chips that have already been drawn, basically your discard pile, back in. And there's a lot of tactics to this, trying to figure out what's still left in your bag and what's already out. Like, if all your time tokens are already got out, why not keep drawing? But if you really need to get a sword, which is combat, or, or a helmet, which is the magic, so craft and strength, if you really need a craft and your only craft is out on the table, you're going to have to refresh your bag before drawing. So it seems like they chose to go with the nice bags to allow them to get some heavy use in, especially mm -hmm. with littler hands that may be a little less deliberately gentle. Yeah, that makes perfect sense, actually. I hadn't thought of that. They, like I said they are high-quality bags. They are nice. Like I don't think they're silk, but they're silky. <laughs> Put it that way. So you continue doing this, going around the board, having encounters, and improving your characters by adding treasure chips to your bag while trying to complete whatever the scenario objective is before time runs out. Because each scenario has a time track, and the length of that actually varies. Now, it is worth noting, there is no death in this game, your characters can't die, and the monsters don't really fight back. It's just all about how much time everything takes. So your penalty for not killing a monster is you might have drawn a time token. Or when it's your turn, you might have rolled the four on the dice and advanced the time token. You only actually lose if time runs out. Well, I'm a big fan of games that are aimed at, aimed at a certain age not having player elimination, especially in a co-op setting. So, now that we've got a rough idea of how to play, what did you think of the Talisman Legendary Tales? All right, I've got to admit, the first time we played Talisman Legendary Tales, this was all four of us, Deanna, both my girls and I, I was not impressed, no, and neither was Deanna. This game was almost nothing like the Games Workshop game I grew up and loved, grew up on. Yes, there are talismans, and yes, you're rolling and moving, but they're really, in, in scenario one, there wasn't anything else in common with the original game. And I found that highly disappointing. Now, to be fair, how long had it been since you last actually played Talisman? Could there be some fond memory of the game that, that sort of rose-colored glasses? Uh, uh, Talisman is definitely not a great game, <laughs> to be honest. I'll admit it. No, I've, I've played it since the kids have been born, so I haven't played it with the kids. So it hasn't been too long. But to be honest, Talisman has a lot of flaws with it. The original game does have a lot of flaws from with it. Things like random, getting close to... Any game that has a, a thing that resets you to zero is terrible. And Talisman has that. You can be playing along and advance your character and almost ready to win, and all of a sudden you get turned into a toad. And you just lose everything. And it's a game that I honestly think is... is it's fun for the first hour, it's fun for the last hour, but those four hours in the middle kind of suck. So... <laughs> It is not my favorite game, but I, there are elements of that game I wanted to see because I do have fond memories. I loved it as a kid, but I didn't know better. Plus, it, I was a kid. I had time. So maybe Talisman should be on our list for games to play when you're stuck at home because you have that six hours to play. And and you, you, you get that final victory at the end, and those six hours might feel worth it. But my cousin and I played Talisman so much. We once played over an entire weekend where we decided our goal was we were going to kill every monster in the adventure deck. And that took us until Sunday playing every night. It was insane. Uh, so I do have fond memories of it, but I was just expecting this to be a modern, better version of Talisman. And really, there's not 
as much as I had hoped in common. This is not a new talisman, a modern talisman. It is a game with talisman trappings. And that really disappointed me the first time. Plus, I expected a heavier game. I did not realize how light this was going to be. Yes, I knew it was a family-friendly game, but I was expecting something of a uh, Stuff Fables level or a Mice and Mystics level, something with a little bit more meat to it. Well, one thing, one thing I note is uh, the game says 14 plus on it, uh, which is very obviously their way of getting around safety things. Yes. Because the community on Board Game Geek very loudly says 6 plus. Like, yeah. this is not a game for 14 plus, except for the fact they didn't have to do the safety testing. They said no, that. That, that, that is a common thing with board games, to be honest. That is a very common thing. Yeah, six plus six would be pushing it. Six, you would have to help. Six would be, yeah, you get to pull stuff out of the bag. Let's see what you got. But I'm going to move you over here <laughs> kind of gameplay. Now, what I did find, though, despite, like I said, really not liking the game at first. I like I, I don't want to, I, I can't stress that enough. Like, it was enough that I was like, oof, I don't know if I even want to play this again. I did find over time, I think a big part of it is getting past scenario one. Uh, scenario one, which introduces the game, I think was a little more friendly. In later games that my feelings on the game started to change for one the more i played the more little bits of talisman that i started to notice uh things like the treasure chips those are actually every single one of the treasure chips is either a fo follower or an item from the original game and they all kind of do similar things like a mule lets you carry more stuff by drawing more chips out of your bag and the priestess lets you draw an additional token whenever you draw magic and like they all actually kind of tied in and the fact, yeah, it's a sword and a helmet. If I call them strengths and craft, it does feel more like it. And the one in particular, Scenario 3, felt distinctly more like the original game. Because this one, you were going up against a boss monster. Two of them, actually. And there's no way you could beat them with your base characters. But in that scenario, there's treasure chests hidden all over the map. So you were literally wandering around the map, trying to defeat monsters and level up to go fight the big boss. And to be honest, that's pretty much the original talisman summed up really quickly. So since you don't level up between scenarios, they force you to level up within them, yes. which is a workable solution. Yeah, it's definitely a standalone game. Like, I honestly don't see any reason you couldn't play them out of order, except there's an arbitrary rule that says you have to earn so many points to unlock the next scenario. Like, there wasn't, there is a slightly ongoing story. Maybe if I get to the end, it'll be a little, like, maybe I'll see more of the ongoing story. But so far, all three of the scenarios could have been completely different. Now, I am saying this is similar to Talisman, but don't get the wrong idea it started to feel a bit more like Talisman. It's still not at all the same game. Uh, for one thing, this game is super light. Like, I think it's a 1.1 on Board Game Geek. You don't get much lighter than that. This is a family weight game that is probably not going to have enough meat for most gamers. Plus, it's a co-op game, which is completely different from the classic Games Workshop game, which is really a take-that-very-competitive-stab-you-in-the-back kind of game. Yeah, this is not an antagonistic dungeon crawler. No, not at all. This is a happy, friendly, let's go explore the forest and maybe kill some goblins. But the important question, I think, is, though, is to throw out the talisman name, right? How does Legendary Journeys, Legendary Journeys? I can't even remember. Legendary, Legendary Tales, Tales, sorry. How does Legendary Tales stand on its own? And in that regard, I think it does an admirable job for what it is. A light fantasy romp that's playable by and with the whole family. I think it's an excellent game. But more importantly, my kids have loved it. Like Sean mentioned earlier, my kids even love the I Spy element of the game. I personally it drove me nuts. And Deanna, I think, was willing to flip the table while we couldn't find one fairy the first time we played. But man, my kids love it. Where, where, Where's the one spot that has a mushroom, a fairy, and a bone? Where's the one spot? We got to find the goblin base. Like, come on. Personally, I just want to look up and go, okay, here's a chart of all the territories. What has a bone, a fairy, and a mushroom on it? Okay, there it is. It's the ruins. Let's go. But hey, I didn't want to ruin their fun. The, the kids had fun doing it. Now, is it playable by the kids on their own? I think at this point, my kids could play it on their own. I think it would matter mainly on the age group. The most difficult part is the seeding, the setting up. And if it's if this is the same problem that some of the um, older Arkham Horror games have and Mansion of Madness have, if you put something in the wrong place, you may be able to not complete a mission. Or if you forget to put a token out. So it's just that attention to detail. So it's going to very much depend on your kids. If your kids have that attention to detail, if they're really good at following the instructions by far, it's going to be great. I'll admit my kids are not there because the reason um, we lost scenario three 
multiple times is someone didn't read the full paragraph and stopped a little early, and we completely missed the special rule that was in play because she didn't read far enough. She didn't have that attention to detail. She was like, oh, we put our stuff on the map. Oh, now we got to fight these goblins. Okay, so that's what we're doing is fighting the goblins? Yeah, we're fighting the goblins. And we start playing through and fighting the goblins. We're like, hey, we killed the goblins. All right, we won. Uh, continue reading. He goes, special rule. The goblin boss does this. Oh, oops. <laughs> so <laughs> I, I at this point, I think my kids could play it on their own because now um, Big G has learned that she needs to spend a little more time paying attention to what it says and not assuming the way things go. But again, it's going to be very de dependent on your kids. How is it as a two-player game, do you think, though? Is that I would work. I don't I don't see any reason why not. So you don't play multiple characters. Right. You can play solo. This is yeah, solo. It's, it's one, one to six players yes. as a base game is an interesting yep. count. Yeah, one to six players because it, basically it's one of those games where because the monsters don't attack, it's just based on what you do on your turn, it doesn't matter. Uh, it reminds me of like uh, Shadows Over Camelot. We're on your turn, everything's going to happen. So if a player is there or not there, it doesn't matter. It's going to happen anyway. Yeah. So the only way to get the hourglasses are by players drawing things out of their bags or rolling the dice. By more players, you're not going to increase the number of hourglasses. It's still on every player turn, there's going to be an equal chance. Like I, I think it's actually kind of perfectly scalable that way. What I think would be difficult is arguing over who gets those treasure chips once you're up to six players. <laughs> And that's going to be the bag building aspect may be a bit difficult because you're, you're thinning out that resource. But as long as your players are cooperating well, it should be a matter of, hey, you're going to focus on strength. You're going to focus on craft. Now, all of us really enjoyed the cooperative element. So this is a couple things they built into the mechanics that make the game cooperative that I like. Because every character has a chip in their bag that lets you pull a chip from another character's bag, which I thought was really neat. Because this mechanic alone makes it feel like your characters are working together. And a perfect example is I'm playing the wizard. I go up and I draw a goblin that has two swords. My wizard only has one sword in his bag, but the troll has three swords in their bag. So if I can draw my draw from someone else's pouch, I'm going to ask the troll to help me. And I thought that was a really neat mechanic. Plus, there's also the added fact that whenever you get a treasure ship, you can put it in any character's bag, which also increases that co-op feel. Yeah, I must say the idea of sharing aspects is interesting and much different than what you see in most, like, co-op deck builders mm -hmm. where you're working together but you're really focusing on what you can do exclusively generally uh in order to make yourself better for the for the good of yeah. the party rather than what you can do or how you can help others and and then sort of you know literally physically help others with with bits no i i totally agree and that, that's one of the the shining highlights of this game like i've yet to see a game do that and the fact you've got the bag builder where you can ask other people for help basically really ties the cooperative field together. Now, of course, there's the disconnect that your character's standing over here and mine's over here. How am I getting something out of your bag? But you know what? We just ignore that. It is You're a game. throwing it. Throwing it. Yeah, there you go. We're throwing it. Now, the one thing I do want to talk about is replayability, because this is what's going to scare people. This game only comes with five scenarios, and you are going to play one scenario when you sit down in one play. We played four games tonight, so that shows how often you can play. You can feed through those. So you're limited to these five, but I got to say the designer has done a pretty good job of adding random elements to each scenario to make them more fun. Um, plus there's the whole difficulty level thing. So you can, if you do beat the game playing on level two, every time you can go back and try to beat everything on level three. So at least there's a reason. And I'm going to guess that you or more likely your kids are going to want to go through and try to get the maximum points. So how different is it between the different difficulties? Like there's some re replayability uh within each scenario but when you when you step up from one to two to three all it does is reduce the number of turns you have so on easy you have say 14 turns on level two you have 12 turns on level three you have 10 turns so that's that's the only actual change so it's how much time you have how much time you can waste now overall Despite my initial impression after of, of this game, after multiple plays, I found that this is a solid family weight cooperative game that so far has been fun for our entire family. Now, there is no way I would break this out for my Monday night gaming group. There's no way I'm going to bring this down to the CG realm and maybe bring it to easy mode to hook those people who are a little trepidatious about playing heavier games. But basically, I'm going to save this for when playing with the kids. But what I will note there is more than enough tactics and tension and strategy required that I am still interested. So this is a game that the adults aren't going to necessarily be bored while playing with the kids. There's enough meat there. 
It's just probably not enough. Like, well, it probably is enough to keep an adult group happy, but there's better games you could be playing, to be honest. Something with more depth and more reward. If you've got kids who are into fantasy settings and like co-op games, I suggest picking this game up, which, again, is totally different than what I felt after the first play. So this is just a good way to see that it takes multiple plays to actually see the game. Uh, just don't go picking it up expecting a follow-up to Talisman. This is not Talisman Part 2. This is not a modern Talisman. To be honest, it's barely Talisman at all. There are some Talisman trappings scattered here and there, but mostly they're going to feel like Easter eggs for someone who knows the original game. Like, oh, I know what that is, or oh, I remember that follower. That's all you're going to get out of it. This is very much a game on its own. Yeah, and I think the, the, the big problem I see is this age on it, because a lot of people are going to look at that age and 14 plus and yeah. think based on that, that it's going to be more like Talisman than it actually is. And a quick glimpse at the reviews on Board Game Geek indicates that is what has happened. Yeah, this people, adults thought it. That is disguised through its, you know, through its age as not being a game. But it is very much a kid's game that the family can enjoy. Yep. So for a more in-depth look at Talisman Legendary Tales, check out Mo's written review over at tabletopbellhop.com. Just click on Reviews. For those of you here live, that'll go live tomorrow, probably, because it's not quite done yet. 